it's hard to get a good grasp on. Let's figure out what we got with uh, uh, this circulation pattern. And let's talk about Coriolis effect. It's, it, it doesn't really resonate with us too much for practical experience. However, everyone here, and I'm sure, has experienced a couple of bumps in the airplane. Uh, we have turbulence or whatever, and there's lots of different reasons why there are turbulence. But occasionally, we'll have a, a day where there's a significant amount of turbulence. Recently, it's mostly stable conditions, right? And we enjoy that. Nice, smooth air, easy to fly in. These conditions are going to last for quite some period of time, probably until February. Generally, there will be different times and different times during the day and different days and maybe weeks at a time when uh, the conditions change or maybe they become better or worse than other times. But all of that points directly to uh, stability. So what is the atmospheric stability? And they quantify, when I say they, I'm talking about the scientists, they will quantify atmospheric stability and say, I have, yes, sir. Um, it's uh, on its ability to resist vertical motion. Right, that's one, that's, that's one way of saying it. But what I'm saying is they quantify that. So these scientists are going to quantify that value. They'll say, let's take a look at uh, the exact amount or the lifted K index, the K index and the lifted K index. How can I say exactly whether something resists? Resist is a very uh, vague word. I, I get it. I understand what, what you're talking about. But it's a little bit of a vague word where... I don't know how much of this is occurring. Scientists are going to put that together exactly, and then they'll go through and figure out and forecast uh, moderate or greater conditions, severe conditions, whatever the case may be. Okay? You okay? You got a question? or No? Okay. I'm missing something. Everything's okay? Okay. All right, so the balloon rising, right? Seriously, guys? Okay, the balloon is rising. The balloon is rising and it represents a parcel of air. This parcel of air is going to either rise after it begins to rise, it'll continue to rise, or it will stay where it is, or it will descend back towards the earth. Okay? These are important aspects. A vague memory, rote memory application of, uh, hey, I know that this is a resistance to, to rising or a, a resistance to lifting up in the atmosphere. Okay, understand that. But why and how? This feeds on exactly the building block theory that we were looking at before of heated air. Air density. Air that's either going to continue to rise because of the air around it or it will stay where it is, or will settle back down towards the earth. So the balloon rises, it says decreasing atmospheric pressure causes the balloon to expand, and any time air moves upward, it expands. This is your adiabatic expansion. And air will cool at an adiabatic expansion rate. This is not the lapse rate that we experience as we climb. It is different. Those small details make all the difference in the world. I can promise you. So the small details of air moving through the atmosphere and cooling, or my airplane or aircraft moving through the atmosphere and experiencing a different temperature. Right? The dry adiabatic expansion rate and the standard lapse rate. Those will create a big difference in when, when we're discussing theory and weather theory. Okay, take that same balloon. And again, it doesn't have to be a balloon. It doesn't have to be a balloon at all. The balloon is provided in this example just so that we can have something to hang on to some tangible item that we can, we can touch and we can hold on to. All right? The balloon in this case at the bottom is in water at 31 degrees Celsius. Now they put some water on there so that we know this thing is at 31 degrees Celsius. Plus I have to have some sort of a lifting force. 
every one of those balloons at the bottom begin at 31 degrees Celsius. But then a force occurs, some sort of lifting force occurs. There are many, many different types of lifting forces that could occur. I could have lifting forces from heating from below. I could have lifting forces from air moving across the terrain feature and being forced upwards. Okay? The lifting force, the exact lifting force is not important. What is important is what happens as it begins to rise through the air. We know that we have some expanding air, some expansion is going to cool that air. So inside the balloon, it's in its own little bubble. Each one of those balloons and the air inside the balloons will behave the exact same. As they rise, the balloon expands and 16 degrees Celsius is the magic number. I have 16 degrees Celsius at each time at some value of atmosphere, some value of altitude. Now what happens to that balloon essentially depends on what's going on with the air around it. If I have air around the balloon that is cooler than the air inside the balloon, well, exactly what we spent some time in the last section discussing, that balloon will continue to rise. Okay? So I have what's considered unstable air. In the second example, the balloon goes up, fine. Some lifting force causes this balloon to go up. And it reaches an altitude or a level where the surrounding air is now warmer than the air inside the balloon. Makes sense that that balloon will continue now to go in the opposite direction and continue downwards. If it reaches an altitude or a height, or as it climbs through the atmosphere, the balloon and the air outside the balloon, those temperatures stay the exact same, then it won't move any further upward and it won't go down at all. It will stay right there. Okay? This is the principle from which we were able to right, as aviators, understand and appreciate the differences in stable and unstable air. Now, it's simple for me to get in an airplane, and as a pilot, I know, yeah, it's very smooth. Or, yeah, there was a bump. And depending on the pilot that you're talking to, uh, their assessment of that bump might be a, a little bit extreme, okay? Uh, at least a half a dozen times a year, I look at the weather reports, and somewhere in the state of Florida, uh, there was extreme turbulence reported by a Cessna 172. I don't think that was true, but it happens very often. And I'm just wondering, hmm, how did that person get so confused? Well, here I have unstable air described with a little bit of moisture. So moving up, in this case, what we have is air moving across some sort of terrain feature. And then a lifting force occurs. So I have a lifting force, the air moves up, and this air continues to rise. We have unstable air. That begins to develop associated conditions by which we can compare stable and unstable air. Now, if we're gonna memorize something, okay, fine. I, I don't think we have to memorize it. Some of these things should make sense and I'll try my best to make them so that they do make sense to you. But if we have to memorize something you really wanna pay attention to, what are the characteristics of stable air? What are the characteristics of unstable air? How could I figure out on my drive to the airport with the windows up and the air conditioning on, how can I figure out where I see stable conditions and unstable conditions? How can I start figuring out while I'm flying through the air where I have stable and unstable conditions around me? Because sometimes we can see a long, long ways. It's important to start making those uh, correlations early.
So I can start developing some sort of idea what's happening where I get to my destination. So this is unstable air. What if that balloon expressed the exact same characteristics as the stationary balloon, right? What if this air had stable characteristics? Here we are. It moves up the terrain feature. But as it goes up the terrain feature, cloud develops so that we can see it. Okay, great. We can almost visualize now what the stability is because there's some moisture content. And then it stops moving upward, so it just develops at that constant level. Now, we've seen a lot of this kind of air here within the past several weeks. We've seen a lot of this here. Okay. As I stated earlier, this is somewhat of a culmination of what we talked about so far up until this point. This is unstable air on the left and stable air on the right. These should make sense. Characteristics of unstable air are cumuliform clouds. Now, stop me if anybody is not familiar with cumuliform clouds. Are we okay with that, Vlad? You all right with cumuliform clouds, stratus clouds, stuff like that? Cumuliform, what do I have? I have big, puffy, pillowy clouds, right? They're pillow-like clouds. Very, very tall most of the time. And big. sometimes I can see, I can observe these clouds growing. If I'm flying near them, I can see the top of those clouds growing or expanding even towards the outsides. Those are cumuliform clouds. Now, something else that I'll experience with unstable air, showery precipitation, meaning that it's only raining in one little spot. It might not be raining across the street or maybe even just in the next city over. You know, the next city over is right there in Tamarack. That's not very far away, right? Just a couple miles down the road, it's not raining, but it's pouring down raining here. And then it's raining really hard for five or 10 minutes and it doesn't rain anymore. That's showery precipitation. That's what I expect. And keep in mind also, just kind of dropping seeds in our heads for a moment, that that showery precipitation is usually very, very large water drops, okay? Rough air makes sense, unstable air, rough air, okay. Good visibility. Here's where pilots start, start saying, oh, what's going on? They start squinting their eyebrows. I don't understand. It says un unstable air. There's not supposed to be anything good about that at all. Well, there is, and that is all of the... All of the condensation nuclei, all of the uh, pollutants, everything that would normally cause poor visibility is attached to and forming those large cumuliform clouds. And they contain a tremendous amount of water content. And they contain a lot of the debris and, and uh, uh, pollution and so forth, right? So outside of that, wonderful visibility. Not underneath the rain shower where it's pouring down on top of you. You might not have great visibility underneath that. But outside of that, you've got great visibility. Okay, so it says good visibility except with blowing obstructions. And we have to address ice. The ice that's formed typically with unstable conditions is clear ice. So think what I need to form ice. If I wanted to form ice in that freezer, what would I need? Well, I'd need some sort of moisture. I can't put an empty ice tray in there and expect there to all of a sudden the, the ice genie to come inside and, and plop a few ice uh, pellets in, all right? I also need freezing conditions. So I can't put the water or the moisture, I can't put that water inside the refrigerator. It has to be inside the freezer where the temperatures are below freezing. Same stuff that I would need to develop ice on an airplane. There's a lot of different places we can develop ice on an airplane. And we talked about one of them two days ago with the carburetor icing, okay? This type of ice that we're talking about is structural ice, ice that's forming on the airplane. This structural ice is clear, very large water droplets. And as it comes in contact with the structure of the airplane at a freezing temperature or below, near or below a freezing temperature, it will continue to move as it freezes over that structure. Structure meaning what? Wing, tail surface, strut, landing gear, propeller, spinner, wherever on the airplane, something on that airplane is collecting ice and it's clear ice, okay? 
All right, we'll talk again about ice. Stable air. Stable air is stratiform clouds and fog. So stratiform is a sheet-like cloud, some sort of cloud that's very thin and sheet-like. We've seen conditions like this for the last several weeks has been just fantastic. But sometimes there's also fog. I can tell you that from experience and from living here for a long time, near Lake Okeechobee, we'll get more fog or even Tampa. You'll get more fog there than we will down here. All right, the land breeze, the sea breeze, all this other stuff. And there's a bunch of different types of fog. We'll go through them. But I'll have stratiform clouds and fog. This is a great indication that I have smooth air. Well, yeah, you say, but I have fog. I can't fly in it. <laughs> Not if that fog is directly over your airfield, you certainly can't fly in it, okay? But what I will have, again, very, very smooth air as compared to the rough air and unstable air. Fair to poor visibility in smoke and haze. On that stable day, even if you're not in a cloud, even if you're not in fog, you will still see uh, fair to poor visibility. Now, if I look out on the horizon, I may see just a thin layer of uh, almost pollution out in front of me. And that's the top of a temperature inversion normally, where as I climb, temperatures increase as I move up, as opposed to what I normally expect, and that is temperatures to decrease. So just something to think about for stable air. Very smooth, but I usually can't see very well. Uh, skipped over continuous precipitation, I apologize, but com compared to showery precipitation, continuous is it's raining today, it it's not raining very hard. It's raining today, it's raining tomorrow, it rained for the past three days, it's raining here, Tampa, Daytona Beach, everywhere. Just a long, wide layer of a little bit of rain, not too much, right? Not the showery precipitation we see where it's very heavy, very concentrated, and often very quickly over. This lasts for a long time, continuous precipitation. Comparing that to my rime ice, that's why I get rime ice. Because I have very small water droplets. Same story as the freezer. If I open that freezer, and maybe that freezer hasn't been well maintained properly, at least for a long time, I could see frost inside that. This is similar to what rime ice will look like. Very small, pieces of water that come in contact with the airplane structure and then freeze and accumulate. Very small. This is probably the most common type of icing, okay? Not the most hazardous, but the most common. All right, if we look at the hydro hydrological cycle, right, here it goes. This explains how water and moisture move through our system. Because we just came off a discussion from stability. Stability led us into speaking about clouds, okay? Well, where in the world do these clouds come from? Where in the world do I get the visible moisture necessary for ice? Here it is. The visible moisture that I'm going to get comes through this cycle. So let's see if we can follow this thing around. I've got, in this example, it starts at one point and just continues through. Uh, evaporation from some sort of a from some sort of uh, uh, water source, uh, ocean, a sea, a lake, a pond, whatever it is. Evaporation occurs. Evaporation occurs right inside here, right? The water that we have on on our desk it evaporates slightly. Fine. Okay. After evaporation, I got. Let's see where here. Evaporation and then. I don't know, I think it goes to number two. And anybody see a number two on there? I don't know why. It goes uh, sublimation and, well, thanks a lot, Noah. Look at that. Maybe that's why they didn't put this one out too much. All right. Evaporation, it's going to go towards this cloud at one point in time. Okay. Some way or another, that cloud will form, and that's condensation. Okay, it evaporates, it turns into vapor, essentially. Transportation, it says it takes it somewhere, maybe it goes over here, takes it towards a, a different area, I get it. But it has to have some sort of condensation. That condensation cycle means that exactly like it would be if I took a very, very cold drink 
out of the refrigerator and I set it on the table, after some period of time, the water moisture in the air will condensate on that, on that bottle or on that can. And then I see water on the outside. Maybe I haven't even opened up this drink yet, but I see the condensation. So fantastic, the condensation, this is what's gonna happen as we develop those clouds. Okay, and of course then precipitation, that's fine, comes down in some form or another. Looking over here, again, they have condensation, it goes to precipitation and shower off rainfall back to the surface. And then continues to cycle through and through and through. Now there's a couple other ways that I could get uh, the water or the water vapor to change its states. It's changing states when it goes from liquid in that pond to the water vapor. It's evaporating, but then it could also condensate and then freeze. It could become water and then freeze and become ice. If it skips the states, then that's where I have the sublimation. Okay? It could sublimate and go directly from water vapor to ice or it could sublimate and go from ice straight to water vapor. Not common, but could happen. Not common to where we see it, but it could happen and it could affect our flight conditions as well. Okay, moisture. Think about that air that we were talking about earlier. We said, hey, I've got some moisture. I've got moisture and, or excuse me, I've got an air uh, parcel, balloon, packet, package, whatever we had. I've got air and it's either hot or it's cold. I know that the cold air weighed more. What does that tell me about this cold air? That I have very, very closely spaced or closely separated air molecules that doesn't leave very much room for moisture. So if I attempt to add any moisture through evaporation to cold air, I won't be able to add very much at all. That air will become saturated. In other words, the, the jar is full. I can't put any more water in this parcel of air because the rest of that jar is also full of the air. Okay? So cold air cannot contain as much water vapor as warm air. All right, we've got an example here. Uh, something that's interesting is that the air doesn't show up in this in, in any of these uh, containers. I got a thermometer, I got a container, and then I have water vapor, okay? But I don't see the air. The air temperature is very low on the left side, so there's not much room that remains for water vapor. So I could only have a little bit in there. If the water temperature is very high, like we have on the right side, there's plenty more room for water to exist or for some sort of uh, moisture to exist. So warm air has the capacity to contain more water vapor. Okay, As we go on and develop this story about fog and we develop the story about thunderstorms and clouds and everything else, this is key to our understanding. Another diagram, if you would, the temperature effects of relative humidity. So we're bringing up a new, uh, a new idea, and that is there are some potential grams of water vapor with the small open circle, and there are actual grams of water vapor in the filled in circle. And then as we go across to the right, each one of these changes temperatures. So it gets cooler as we go to the right. There's nothing that indicates we need to be able to determine or estimate relative humidity. So relative humidity, 30%, 53, whatever you see on the bottom, that is an expression. I don't need to make that calculation. And in fact, the only one that I was ever interested in is 100%. It's when it's saturated. But we know these things exist and there are, there are means that scientists use to calculate relative humidity and it could express how much of the water vapor that could be there is actually there. Now on the 30 degree side, <laughs> excuse me, on the 30 degree side you can see I have some water vapor that's actually there. 
there's plenty more room for water vapor to exist. So I don't have a phenomenon that's called visible moisture. Instead, what I have is just exactly what we have in this room right now. I have water vapor, but I can't see it. You guys would all agree with me that water vapor exists. It's right here, right now. There's no doubt, okay? But I can't see it. Cool that same water, or that, that same air. If you make that same air cooler, now a higher percentage of the actual water vapor exists because there's no longer as much room for any more water vapor. I still can't see anything. It's only 50, 53%. So the calculation that they made on this one is 53%, whatever conditions they were controlling, that's fine. I don't see anything. There's just water vapor there. If I cool that same air a little more, the air becomes saturated. This is where we begin to form moisture, moisture that we can see. This is the moisture that you see on the side of the can. This is the moisture that you see when you uh, exhale on a really cold morning, which by the way, I think tomorrow and the next, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday is supposed to be really cold, right? 40 degrees, 50 degrees, freezing. But that's the visible moisture that we see when we exhale and there's very, very cold air out there, right? Know that there's two ways, two distinct ways that you can cause air to saturate. You can take an existing parcel of air and cool it to its dew point. So whatever you have for air, you can cool that air until it reaches its dew point. And that is the temperature where it cannot contain any more moisture. Or I can take air and I continue to add moisture to it. So by a means of evaporation, I cause this air to become saturated because I'm adding moisture to that air. So those are the two ways that I could saturate air or create visible moisture. All right, latent heat transactions, that's fine. We talked about vapor, liquid, solid. Vapor on the right, right, going to solid on the left. Melts the liquid, evaporates the vapor. Vapor condensates and becomes liquid, freezes, becomes ice, solid, right? You got sublimation, deposition, that's fine. There are some latent heat transactions, uh, right? We got some chemistry stuff that's going on with the amount of heat that might be released or absorbed by. And that heat, that amount of heat is tremendous. So there's a large heat transfer when these uh, phase changes occur. Let's talk again about temperature dew point. I brought up the idea for dew point just a moment ago, and that is dew point, which tells me the exact temperature I have to decrease that air to without adding any more moisture before it becomes saturated. Okay, I could increase the dew point by adding more moisture to that. Okay. All right, let's take a look. So relative humidity, again, I never have to calculate this. The only one that's important or the only one that bears any type of uh, true meaning to me is that saturated air, All right? Because we're getting ready to talk clouds here in a second. So relative humidity, 50%, meaning I've got half of my available moisture already in the air. If I look at the temperature of that air, the next one down, it goes from 22 degrees to 15. And I get a higher relative humidity. The dew point is in a dash line going straight across the slide. And that dew point is 11 degrees. So once I cool the air just a little bit more, we reach the dew point and the air becomes saturated. That dew point will continue to decrease as we decrease temperature of that air. So if you have any further decrease in temperature of this air, the dew point will continue to decrease because it can only go up to a set amount of, of uh, uh, humidity. It can only go up to 100%. There are, there's no more capacity after that. Well, what happens when the air becomes saturated? We get clouds. 
and the clouds could be different forms, like we were talking earlier, cumuliform or stratus clouds. And those clouds are named according to their height above ground level. So I got low clouds at 6,500 and below. Those are characterized as low clouds. There's nobody out there, I get it. There's nobody out there with a, with a measuring device like the little uh, Disney World theme park things. You, you have to be this high to, to ride this ride. No, well, I'm still a low cloud, I can't, do, no. Doesn't exist, but somewhere vicinity 6,500, okay. Those are low clouds. Low clouds have no prefix, okay. If it's a stratus cloud, they call it stratus. If it's some sort of combination mixture of the two, stratocumulus, right, some sort of hybrid cloud. If it is a rain cloud, it will contain the prefix or suffix nimbo or nimbus. That does not indicate thunderstorm. It doesn't indicate or even imply thunderstorm. All it means is rain cloud, nimbo or nimbus. Okay. Now, those clouds between 6,500 and 20,000 AGL, these are your alto clouds or middle clouds. I don't know, maybe Latin, who knows what language this is. I speak American, okay? So I don't know what all different languages these are other than empanage is French, and I don't know how they got their hands on that. But alto is some sort of a who knows what uh, prefix for middle. Alto stratus or alto cumulus? These are the two examples that are listed on the screen. Above 20,000 AGL, I have Ciro or Cirrus. That's why they named this airplane that, I guess. About half of them will never make it to 20,000, but whatever. Some of them will get up there. Ciro stratus, Ciro cumulus, or Cirrus clouds, right? That's how I can identify rapidly by looking at a weather report, you know, what's the, what's the height, the relative height or the approximation for height on these clouds. Now there's one other approximation or uh, characterization of cloud with respect to height. And that is clouds that go through two or more of those groups. So it might be it's low and middle, or it's low, middle, and high, or middle and high. These are clouds with vertical development, okay? What kind of conditions would I probably have if I had clouds with vertical development? Stable or unstable? Unstable. Perfect, all right. So this one, for instance, is cumulonimbus, or a cumulus cloud. A cumulus cloud certainly could just go up into from a low to a middle cloud. All right, cloud-based estimation. Anybody know how to do this? Yeah. You do? Okay. Have you ever done it before other than for a written exam? Um, yeah, I did, I did it a lot. You did a lot? Yeah, there's even in the calculator. In what calculator? Uh, no, first I knew how to do it. All right. With this one, and then once I got the aviation calculator, the SA, and then I used to learn that one. You're talking about the digital one. Okay. All right, so this does have a little bit of meaningful usage, okay? Uh, most of the time, I have a weather report, and it's going to show me my temperature dew point. It will also show the cloud bases, okay? But this is an opportunity for me to somewhat prove what we've done already and what we've examined already with saturation. What I could do with the cloud-based estimation is find the difference between the surface temperature and the dew point and call that value the spread or the temperature dew point spread. You divide that by 4.4 if the temperatures are in Fahrenheit or by 2.5 if the temperature is in Celsius, then multiply by 1,000 and that will give you your cloud base and feet, but it'll give it to you in AGL. So if your field elevation is not Fort Lauderdale Executive, which is close to zero, then I gotta add my field elevation to it. Pretty much anywhere in Florida I do this and this is gonna give me my bases at MSL, pretty close. But if I'm flying in the mountainous terrain, I gotta make sure that I apply that field elevation.
Okay, and that's what you get with step three. Add the results too. Okay, so what is this telling me? This is telling me that temperature is going to decrease by a certain amount. That dew point will also decrease by a certain amount, or the adiabatic dry index, right? It'll decrease by that amount. So these two values are going to come together at a rate of 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. That rate of 4.4 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet tells me this is where saturation occurs. When temperature and dew point, which are both expressing a, a, a standard lapse rate of a certain amount, these two values converge or they equal each other at the base of the clouds. Okay. Saturation could also occur on the ground. Well, we call that fog. So radiation fog, what we were talking about at the very, very beginning, radiation fog is heat radiating from the Earth's surface. It absorbs heat the entire day. Now, heat radiates from the surface. So I got heat radiating from the surface at night. It cools the bottom air until it reaches saturation. Exactly what we were describing in slide number two, and that was cooling the air that's adjacent that land or that surface, whether it's water or land, doesn't really matter. As that air cools, it reaches the dew point, and reaching the dew point, now we get visible moisture. All right? So fog forms first at the surface, thickening as, as cooling continues. Further radiational cooling at top of the fog layer deepens it. Okay? We see this a lot of times in Florida, but we don't see it so often as uh, even a thin layer of fog, you'll see it very often as dew. It doesn't take very long at all. Nice warm day, plenty of moisture out there. Sun goes down like it is right now. If it's very, very moist outside, within a couple of hours, I'll have fog. Uh, I'll have dew on the, on the surface, on the vehicle, on the grass, all sorts of stuff. The next picture is, uh, this is an approximation of radiation fog, right? So what happened in this area? There's some moist air laying in a valley, and then uh, probably, it looks like it may be slightly sunrise. I still see shadows on those trees. But before that sun heated the surface, all that heat that was absorbed by the surface the previous day was released. It cooled that area, and then it reached the dew point. This is your radiation fog. Okay, one of the types of fog that requires wind, and there's, there's a couple, one of them that requires wind is advection fog. Here I have warm air. It moves over a cool surface. That surface could be water. That surface could be land. That surface could be a, a wide variety of different things, right? A combination of them, whatever. Warm air moves, warm moist air moves over a cool surface and it becomes fog. Where's that? Okay. So what's the temperature of the water near, surf, near San Francisco usually? Very cold. Anybody try to swim out there? Cold, right? Well, I guess unless you're from Russia. Then it's not cold. All right. So warm, moist air coming over that cool water creates fog. All right, upslope fog. Again, starts with moist, warm air. It always, always does. And then as the air moves, moves up the terrain, fog forms on the slope. I have adiabatic expansion. I've got cooling air. It cools to the saturation point. Fog forms, and that's upslope fog. An example of upslope fog, there it is. I got a body of water down here. This implies that I have warm, moist air. Perhaps I have some wind that's moving that air, that warm, moist air up the terrain feature. It cools as it rises, becomes fog. All right, another type of fog, steam fog. So a very warm lake, 
under cool air. The heat is going to be released. The heat releases from the, uh, from the water, pond, whatever in the world, from the water source. And then as that occurs, we've got a rapid decrease in that temperature. So it's adding air more, adding uh, water vapor and moisture to the air, and then cools rapidly, which becomes steam fog. A couple of things that I need to be concerned about with steam fog, particularly for flight crews. Low level turbulence can occur and icing can become hazardous. Remember, you've got air that's very, very cold and you've got some sort of moisture below that air released into the cold air. So the change of state is occurring right there. If I'm flying through this, I could gather a, a tremendous amount of icing, right? Pointing to icing again, here it is. Side view icing of a uh, wing with clear ice, all right? The most hazardous type of icing condition that could exist, well, I suppose except for hail, and that's not an icing condition, but that is a hazard. But the most hazardous is freezing rain because of its accumulation rate. It will accumulate very, very rapidly and may exceed any type of uh, de-icing or anti-icing equipment that I have. They did that to Air France, right? That exceeded the capability of their pitot tubes. After the initial impact of the supercooled droplets from large raindrops, so this implies again large raindrops, showery precipitation, unstable conditions, the remaining liquefied portion flows out over the surface and freezes gradually. This freezes as a smooth sheet of solid ice. It is hard and heavy and is difficult to remove. So if I have an airplane with no icing capability, well, we have there 5208 Juliet. Can I fly that into known icing? Nope. All right. But if I'm flying into conditions that become known icing, I didn't know it was there beforehand, but it's here now. I get something like this, we might be in trouble. Uh, if I have anti-icing or de-icing capabilities, maybe I have wing boots and I blow my wing boots, that's fine, that works, unless the icing exceeds the capability of that process, right? So I might have some system that is only on the leading edge of the wing, but now this icing develops over the unprotected surface of the wing. That becomes a hazard too, a, a great hazard. All right, rime ice, like we were discussing earlier. Rime is brittle and frost-like. Looks like frost. I described frost in the uh, freezer, and that's about what it looks like. Form from small supercooled droplets when the remaining liquefied portion after initial impact freezes rapidly before the drop has time to spread over the surface. It traps air between the droplets and gives the ice a white appearance. It's lighter in weight than clear ice. So clear ice can accumulate rapidly with weight or accumulates weight rapidly because it's, it's a very heavy chunk of ice out there on your airfoils. It is lighter in weight than clear ice. Its formation is irregular and its surface is rough. It's brittle and more easily removed than clear ice. Uh, so this one is probably heavier. That one maybe not as heavy. Are, is there any difference in the hazard here? Do I need to only be concerned with weight on ice? Remember two days ago when we were talking aerodynamics and we said that it had to have some laminar flow. There's a boundary layer laminar flow over the upper and, and lower cambered surfaces. This rime ice will disrupt that smooth flow of air. So when it disrupts the smooth flow of air, the air can become turbulent at a, at a speed much higher than on my normal stalling speed. Okay? So I may have a stall at much higher air speeds than I would in a normal, uh, normal airfoil. Okay, again, to review clear and rime ice and mixed ice, a mixture of the two. Holy smokes, the only thing we've had simple all day long, mixed ice, just a mixture of rime and, and clear ice. Okay. And that's formed when super cool water droplets are of various sizes or intermingled with snow or ice particles. After initial impact, the remaining portion freezes rapidly and forms a mushroom shape on the leading edges of a wing. Ice particles are embedded in clear ice and form a hard and rough edged mass. 
If I experience ice pellets, you can see ice pellets at the very bottom of that slide. Ice pellets at the surface or at an altitude indicate that I more than likely have freezing rain at higher altitudes. This is great except that the word ice pellet does not resonate usually very well with pilots. And I wonder where you mean ice pellet. It's just a very, very small hail formation, if you would. Hail, technically, is a collection of ice pellets. All right? So small ice pellets that I might experience or encounter, hopefully I'm still on the ground, right? If I encounter these ice pellets, I should know that I have freezing rain at higher altitudes. You got warm, moist air over here, rain, and then as it comes down through the colder air mass, it freezes and becomes ice pellets. Okay, we're talking about freezing, we're coming ice pellets. Let's take a look and consider the differences in the cold fronts and the air masses. So an air mass is nothing more than a a large quantity of air that exhibits similar characteristics of temperature and moisture content with its surrounding environment. It's just taken on that temperature and moisture content from the surrounding environment. As these air masses move, well, depending on how rapidly they move, they may change quickly or they may change, or excuse me, they may change a lot or they may change not so much depending on how quickly they come through the, the, the area. Okay, cold air. Cold air is heavier than warm air. I told you, I knew we we're gonna go over that time and time again and it comes true here. That cold air mass moves in a direction and will move the warm air out of the way exactly the same as a snow plow, okay? So this will push and move the warm air out of the way. But at the boundary layer, the layer between the two air masses, the front, I get some mixture here of not only uh, rising motion, not only cold air moving rapidly and forcing the warm air out of the way, causing some turbulence all on its own, but also warm, moist air that is cooled to its dew point and becomes visible moisture. This entire phenomena is, is violent. Depending on the strength of that low cold or that low pressure system that usually drives these things, this could create very, very serious weather. Very hazardous weather. So take a look at that cold air. It's moving, it's moving the warm air out of the way. We see a couple of different cities here and look at the, the proximity of each other. So St. Louis, 200 miles away is Indianapolis. Another 200, Columbus, Ohio, another 200, Pittsburgh. Okay. This is a large geographical area, in other words. As that front moves through, something that will occur and something that does occur with every single front in existence is right here. That is a change in wind direction. You see the wind at Indy, Columbus, and Pittsburgh? They're all kind of, yeah, a little bit almost quasi-parallel to that front. We can see them coming close to the isobars just as we said they would but then this one is also close to being parallel to the isobars and maybe angled towards the low pressure okay uh, we got some friction layer but a large change in wind direction this always occurs and I don't say always or never very often this always occurs after the front passes a front passage will cause a change in wind direction. Okay, we can take a look at the METARs. Of course, you got uh, heavy rain and thunderstorms here uh, over Indy. Some pretty serious weather right there. That's fine. 
We'll examine, I'll put up a list here between the two different types of fronts, cold fronts and warm fronts, and, and see how one compares to another. Okay, there's the warm air, the warm front. Warm fronts are characterized by smiley faces because they're really not so dangerous, right? As opposed to cold fronts, which have all jagged teeth, all right? So smiley faces, I got a warm front. Look at this warm air. It does not weigh as much as the cold air. So when the interaction occurs, warm air is going to move over the top of the cold air and gradually move the cold air out of the way. Now, if I'm moving a, uh, a small trailer with a tractor, in other words, something that doesn't weigh very much with something that weighs a lot, it moves very rapidly. But if I'm moving a large trailer with a lawnmower, it's not going to move very much. It's not going to move as quickly. So here, essentially, that's what I have. Something that doesn't weigh very much trying to push something that weighs much more out of the way. This is the interaction that occurs. All right. Well, back to like what I said. What happens as the front passes? Change of wind direction. No surprise. Always happen. And I don't say always very much at all. Again, you've got the same proximity. Everybody's kind of in the clear. I don't see any heavy rain and thunderstorms over here. I got some haze. That's interesting. A little haze. Got some rain all over the next 200, maybe 250, 300 miles. It's a lot like continuous precipitation, right? But this warm air just moves over it very nice and easy and at a much slower speed. You got nimbo stratus. Nimbo means what again? Rain. So nimbo stratus, I got stratus or sheet-like clouds. Alto stratus, middle clouds, right? Okay, kind of neat. Look at the frontal characteristics. Cold fronts have very rapid movement. It gives an average, says 30 knots. I don't know who, why, what, when came up with 30 knots. I have nothing to support that. Cold fronts, and let's see if this kind of equates a little bit to what I said over the last, you know, two hours. Cold fronts pushes under the warm air. Certainly so. I've got a temperature inversion at and behind the surface front. We talked about that temperature inversion for just a little bit. It seemed like an easy thing to say when we we're discussing stable conditions, that I might have a temperature inversion that is air that as I climb through it increased in temperature. Well, where's the temperature inversion? Something that we discussed, something that we know. Where is that in relationship to a cold front? It is at and behind the surface front. So I have cold air as I climb, I climb into warm air. Okay. A very steep frontal slope. A narrow frontal zone at and behind the front. Let me show those pictures again for a second. Look at this frontal zone. So it is uh, the middle of Indianapolis to, all right, maybe St. Louis or so. This is way up there, right? Just a little, we've got heavy rain probably, but it's only in between the two cities. So that definitely compares right here to narrow frontal zone at and behind the front. What about the warm air? goes over the next seven, eight hundred miles, okay? And, and the rain, by the way, is over two total, almost three cities, almost goes to three different cities. So thunderstorm and showers for cold fronts, hmm. Cumuliform clouds for cold fronts, turbulent conditions, good visibility outside of showers. What does this sound like? Unstable. Sounds like unstable conditions. Start associating those two things together. Start knowing that your unstable conditions and cold fronts, these things kind of share the same bedroom, if you would, right? Warm fronts, slow movement. The warm front rides over the cold air. 
The temperature inversion exists at and ahead of the surface front. All right, I think we've seen that. A very shallow frontal slope. Let's look for a second. Shallow frontal slope. So let's say this was a, a, uh, a ramp, like an on-ramp or uh, a handicap ramp to get inside a building and come up with any type of different examples. Let's say this was a ramp. This would be a nice, easy ramp for me to walk compared to this one. This one, I, I might need to have some really nice shoes, right, or a rope or something help me get up there. That's a steep frontal slope. So I have a very shallow frontal slope for the warm front, a uh, wide frontal zone at and ahead of the front, drizzy, excuse me, drizzle and steady precipitation. Here we go again, this sounds like stable air. Stratiform clouds, smooth, poor visibility. I now can associate cold fronts and warm fronts with different types of stability. It de it's not a hard definition that yes, if you have this, you have that. But if I'm looking at a weather chart, a prognostic chart, or a surface analysis chart, and I see cold front moving my way, and in the middle of that cold front is probably a low pressure center, and it's moving rapidly, I expect this type of conditions. I expect some relatively hazardous uh, weather coming my way. All right? Any questions? Pretty straightforward, right? Not too bad. Okay. All right. 